In this video, you're going to hear audio from episode 1 of season 3 of Murderers in Ohio that can be found on Spotify, Google, Apple, or iHeartRadio podcast. This is going to be about a case that started in Logan County and three other states had to get involved to catch one man for murder. It's time to find out why convicted murderer Sam Littleton Jr. was sentenced to life without parole and no chance of appealing his sentence here on Murderers in Ohio. Logan County is on the west side of the state of Ohio, about the middle of the state. The county is northwest of the city of Columbus. A large part of the county is primarily farm areas. The city of Bell Fountain is the county seat of Logan County. The city is 48 miles northwest of Columbus. The county courthouse is in the city. In front of the courthouse sits a three-tier fountain. On top of that fountain is a pineapple. It is supposed to be a symbol of friendship. Bell Fountain in French means beautiful spring. The city has a population of over 14,000 people. Two pro basketball players, politicians, and writers come out of Bell Fountain. One of the people that is from Bell Fountain that impressed me is professional wrestler Sammy Callahan. He currently wrestles for Impact Wrestling and was a former world champion. One more interesting thing about the city. In 1891, Bell Fountain was the first city in America to have a concrete street. I never knew that. It is said that Bell Fountain has an average crime rate for a city its size. I seen something online where it says that the FBI stated that in Bell Fountain, that one out of 73 people have a chance of being a victim of a crime. So for a population of 14,000, that means out of 14,000 people, that 192 people in that city could possibly be a victim of a crime. In the city of Bell Fountain is Eastern Avenue. The avenue runs southeast and is also County Road 10. This would be on the east side of the city. At 729 Eastern Avenue sits a two-story house that has brown vinyl siding with white trim around the doors and windows. There is a driveway on the side of the house. There is a greenhouse on one side and a white house on the other side both one-story homes. The Brown House at 729 Eastern Avenue is a decent-sized home. In the year of 2011, a man and a woman lived in the Brown House. 37-year-old Sam Littleton Jr. and his living girlfriend, who I will only refer to by her first name, Deb. Samuel, or Sammy, as he was called by people close to him, worked at a foundry in Kenton, Ohio, which is north of Bell Fountain. Deb owns her own hair salon in Bell Fountain. The foundry where Sammy worked is called Kenton Iron Works. I will have to say that I have had some help with getting some of this information. I will not mention who the source is, However, this source knew 
Sam Wilton Jr. and other people involved in this case. Sammy is an average sized man with short dark hair and a goatee. He had a truck and rode a black motorcycle. I was told that Sammy was renting the house at 729 Eastern Avenue. However, I see several articles that say that the home was sold to Sammy in the year of 2009. I found online that Sammy also had lived in Lewistown and Huntsville, Ohio. Sammy usually hung around a group of people who rode motorcycles, some would call them bikers. He participated in toy and charity rides on bikes. He had barbecues with friends. He played softball and went to places like the zoo. In the brown two-story home was a full unfinished basement. This is where Sammy liked to make projects out of wood and work on motorcycles. There were times when the basement was filled with gas fumes or the fumes of wood stains. I was told that the basement was where people would smoke. This could be cigarettes or, or marijuana. Sammy was known to smoke weed. Sammy and his girlfriend Deb did spend a lot of time with friends. Sammy and Deb did not have any kids together. Deb did have kids of her own. It is said that a couple of her kids did not come around the house because they did not like Sammy. Then there was Tiffany Brown, Deb's 26-year-old daughter. Tiffany was a single mom with shoulder-length dark hair. She was the mom of two little boys. Tiffany had an apartment in Bell Fountain. She was trying to go to school and work to provide a better life for her kids. It is said that Sammy and Tiffany did get along with each other. Tiffany had spent time at Sammy's house with Sammy and her mom. I have been told that when Deb could not go on a charity ride or a special ride event, that Tiffany would go with Sammy. Sammy acted as much of a father as he could to Tiffany, even though he wasn't her dad. He loved her kids. What could possibly cause things to go horribly wrong for these people in the year of 2011? On Friday, February the 11th of 2011, Tiffany Brown dropped her kids off at a neighbor's house around 4.45 p.m. in the afternoon. She was going to run some errands and eventually come back to pick up her kids. However, Tiffany never did come back to pick up her kids. At 11.30 p.m. that night, the kid's grandma, Deb, picked them up. No one had heard anything from Tiffany. A single mom doesn't just drop off her kids and disappear. If something happened to where a single mom could not pick up their kids at the time they said they would, they usually call or text someone to let them know what's going on. It was a Friday evening a person could have went out with friends. The next morning, February the 12th, a Saturday, Deb, Tiffany's mom, called the Bell Fountain Police Department. She reported to the police that her daughter, 26-year-old Tiffany Brown, was missing. Law enforcement would find out around 9 a.m. that day that Tiffany's cell phone activity ended near the cell phone towers near Kenton, Ohio, which is north of Bell Fountain. This would only tell law enforcement that Tiffany was somewhere in the Bell Fountain or Canton area the last time that she used her cell phone, which was on February the 11th, sometime after she dropped off her kids. There is evidence that Tiffany had gone to a bank on February the 11th. Online, there was some confusion on whether this was before or after she dropped off her kids. She had gone to the bank before she dropped off her kids. After Tiffany was reported missing, 
Sammy and Deb did have people over to the house on Eastern Avenue. People sat in the kitchen at the kitchen table. There was a doorway in the kitchen that went down to the basement. People sat no more than five feet from that basement door. The brown two-story house is said to have an open floor plan. The front door was between the living room and dining room. At this point in time, Sammy was not allowing anyone down in the basement where they sometimes smoked. Sammy said that he was working on a project in the basement. He did not want anyone smoking down there around the fumes. Sammy would occasionally not allow anyone down there to smoke. There was six to seven steps that went down to a landing. Once on the landing, a slight turn would lead to another door, which was locked. I was told that at this time, Sammy was using meth and heroin. His addiction was getting bad. Wild parties and drug use are not uncommon in the biker groups. It doesn't make them bad people. It would take a couple of days before law enforcement could catch a small break in the disappearance of Tiffany Brown. A car was located at an apartment complex in Bell Fountain. On February the 14th, a Monday, around 1 in the afternoon, Tiffany's car was located behind a apartment building, not too far where Tiffany lived. The keys had been left inside of the vehicle. There was no signs of Tiffany. Law enforcement could at least search the car for evidence. A person who might have watched this on the news probably would think that this would be good news for Tiffany's mom, Deb, and Deb's boyfriend, Sammy. Tiffany's family and friends had to be worried about her and wanted her to come home. Bell Fountain Police stayed active with their investigation into Tiffany's disappearance. The Logan County Sheriff's Department would soon start a missing person investigation of their own. At this point, no one knew that these two things were tied together. On February the 16th, around 6 p.m. in the evening, the Sheriff's Department would get a call. The caller had said that his neighbor's car was missing. They lived outside of the city of Bell Fountain. The caller said that his neighbors would not drive at night. At this time, the Sheriff's Department didn't do much about the call. The call was only about a missing vehicle. The caller was talking about 84-year-old Richard Russell and his wife, 84-year-old Gladys. They lived on an 80-acre farm outside of the city of Bell Fountain. 6.20 that same evening, a truck was found abandoned on a back road about a mile or two from the Russell's farm. The truck was registered to Deb. However, the main driver of the truck was Sammy Lilton Jr. Keys and a cell phone belonging to Sammy were left in the truck. This only brought up questions for law enforcement. Later that evening, around 9 p.m., law enforcement went to the house at 729 Eastern Avenue to do a second interview with Deb, Tiffany's mom, and now the owner of the abandoned truck. Officers actually gone inside of the brown two-story home to talk to Deb. During this second interview with Deb, an officer noticed something in the house. A officer noticed a shirt or a piece of clothing that appeared to have blood stains on it and what appeared to be a bloody handprint. The officers left that night with plans on getting a search warrant for the house on Eastern Avenue. Sometimes getting a search warrant is not a quick process, especially late at night. They would have to wait till the next day. At this point, I'm wondering what Tiffany's mom, Deb, was thinking. What was on her mind after the second interview with law enforcement? 
This also brings up a question for me. Why didn't Deb, Tiffany's mom, notice the shirt or piece of clothing with bloodstains on it? It was in a spot where an officer could spot it during an interview, but she lived there and did not notice it. I keep a messy house at times, but I can still notice when things are out of place or don't look right. Now something else happened on the evening of February the 16th of 2011, which was on a Wednesday. This is something that the Logan County Sheriff's Department did not know at the time. Around 11.30 in the evening, at a rest stop on southbound Interstate 75 in Butler County, a Ohio State Trooper was running a random license plate check at the rest stop. I never knew they did that at rest stops. The state trooper ran the plates on a green Mercury Grand Marquise. The owners of this car was Richard and Gladys Russell. The car did not stand out to the state trooper though at the time. The plates were valid and the car had not been reported stolen. The trooper never saw who was driving the car. The car had only been reported as not being seen at the Russells' home. The Russells should be the only ones driving the car. The couple did not have any kids. Richard was a farmer but having health issues. He had sometimes walked with a walker. Gladys was a former bookkeeper. She wore glasses and had gray hair like her husband. They weren't in the best of health for a long trip. They both took medication. I don't have an exact time. On the morning of February the 17th, law enforcement goes back to 729 Eastern Avenue, the home of Sammy Lilton Jr. and his live-in girlfriend Deb. They show up at the house with a search warrant. While searching the house, they go down into the basement to look around. On the landing in the basement, under a pile of scrap wood was the partially clothed body of 26-year-old Tiffany Brown. Tiffany's body had been inside her mom's house the whole time. Law enforcement would notice that Tiffany had been stabbed. She had been in the basement for six to seven days. It seemed like after that many days someone would have noticed a smell coming from the basement from the body decomposing. I read somewhere that it usually takes 24 hours to three days for a dead body to give off an odor. If it did start to smell, why didn't anyone notice a different smell in the house? Later that afternoon, on February the 17th, law enforcement would name their person of interest in the Tiffany Brown homicide case. That person was Sammy Lilton Jr. They also stated that Deb, Tiffany's mom, was not a suspect. The Bellfound Police Department went from a missing person case to a homicide investigation. At this point in looking into Sammy Lilton Jr., I'm wondering two things. And I gotta say these two things even if it upsets some people. First off, I'm wondering who all knew, and I mean who all honestly knew, what happened to Tiffany. And second, did Sammy maybe have an unknown attraction for Tiffany that he never told anyone about? Or maybe he did tell someone about. Around 4.45 that afternoon, Logan County Sheriff's Department would get a call. The call would be from the same neighbor who reported the Russell's car missing. Now, the caller wanted to report the couple was missing from their home outside of Bell Fountain. At 8.40 p.m., after finding a piece of paper with Sammy's cell phone number on it inside of the Russell's home, the Logan County Sheriff's Department put out an alert for the Russell's car. After an alert was put out for the Russell's car, the Logan County Sheriff's Department found out that the car had been seen at the rest stop in Butler County. 
Law enforcement went to that rest stop, wanting to look through the trash can, but the trash had already been picked up. The trash that had been picked up had been taken to a Rumpke landfill in Cincinnati. They were looking for clues that could tell them where the Russells could be. The next day on February the 18th, law enforcement puts out an arrest warrant for Sam Littleton Jr. They were going to charge him for the murder of Tiffany Brown. The charges were going to be for murder, felonious assault, and abuse of a corpse. Law enforcement did have a reason for doing this. Tiffany's cell phone activity ended on February the 11th of 2011. They found out the last person that Tiffany had contact with was Sam Littleton Jr. There were texts about discussing a Valentine's gift for Tiffany's mom. Sam wanted her to come over to his house. The last text message from Tiffany was to Sam saying, okay, be there in 10, meaning she would be at Sam's house in 10 minutes. Then they found the truck that Sam drove that was registered to Deb, Tiffany's mom. Now Sam was missing and a nationwide manhunt for Sam Littleton Jr. was about to begin. Back on February the 16th, around 9.50 in the morning, this was before law enforcement's second interview with Deb, Sam had left work early from Kenton Iron Works in Kenton, Ohio. This was when law enforcement, thanks Sam, went on the run. He was either getting really paranoid, not knowing what to do, or someone tipped him off that law enforcement would be coming back to his house. So on February the 18th, Sammy was wanted for the murder of Tiffany Brown and also wanted for questioning about the whereabouts of Richard and Gladys Russell. All law enforcement had to do was find Sam Littleton Jr. I was told that at least one of Sammy's friends was looked into as someone that could have possibly been involved with Tiffany's murder or maybe even knew about it or maybe even helped Sam Littleton after the murder. However, nothing ever came of it. Law enforcement did talk to Sammy's ex-wife. Her last name is Queen. She told law enforcement about a time that Sammy tried to attack her once with a knife and had locked her down in a basement. Sounds similar to what he did to Tiffany. She never told anyone because she was scared for her life. They talked to Queen on February the 20th. Queen also told law enforcement that Sammy could have possibly gone to West Virginia. Sammy's dad lives there in a remote area of the state. Sammy kept some of his life secret. Someone who knew him for years did not even know that Sammy had kids of his own. Law enforcement talked to others who knew Sammy, even Sammy's co-workers. One of Sammy's co-workers said that Sammy was using LSD up to three weeks before Tiffany's murder. Everyone they talked to said that Sammy acted differently after Tiffany was reported missing. Deb and co-workers of Sammy told law enforcement about scratches on Sammy's hands and neck. Sammy told people that he was cleaning a fireplace crate and he dropped it, causing himself to get all scratched up. Deb had also told law enforcement that Sammy had bought cleaning agents. He told her that a dog had peed in the basement and he had to clean it up. She also said that he was guarding the basement, keeping everyone out. Deb believes that Sammy wanted a tax refund that Tiffany had received. She believes that there could have been an argument over that tax refund. Whatever the reason was, it was a vicious, violent attack on Tiffany Brown. A coroner's report will say that Tiffany was stabbed ten times in the chest, twice in the back, and three times in the neck. That is 15 times total that Tiffany was stabbed. Then she was left in the basement under a pile of scrap wood. They did determine that she most likely died in that basement. Was it all of the drugs that caused Sammy to snap like he did? Did he want Tiffany's tax refund money for drugs? 
All this made law enforcement concerned about the Russell couple. They had found a piece of paper with Sammy's cell phone number on it. The truck Sammy drove was found a mile or two from the Russell's house. The Russell's did know Sammy. The Russell's were the people who sold Sammy the house at 729 Eastern Avenue back in 2009. The Russell couple's family were worried about Richard and Gladys. The house was gone over. Nothing was out of place. The couple's medication was still at the house and they wouldn't have gone on a trip without their medication. Law enforcement needed to locate the Russell couple. Law enforcement had gone to Rumpke Landfill in Cincinnati to ask if there was any chance of finding the trash that was collected at the rest stop. On February 21st, around 10 in the morning, the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation started searching for clues on the Russell's whereabouts. They had spent most of the day there and found nothing. They went back the next day and got the same results. The manhunt for Sammy Lilton Jr went to the state of West Virginia on February the 22nd of 2011, a little after 11 in the morning. The Princeton Police Department gets a call from Sammy's dad. He told the police that Sammy had just called him from a phone at a marathon gas station there in Princeton, West Virginia. He had called the police shortly after hanging up the phone with Sammy. Princeton police officers rushed to the gas station. However, Sammy was gone. They now know that Sammy was somewhere in the Princeton, West Virginia area. Later that afternoon, Sammy's dad and sister goes on West Virginia local TV and plead for Sammy to turn himself in. Did they think that he was just sitting back somewhere watching TV? In Ohio, back in Cincinnati, the search at the landfill was suspended, but the area was kept secure for a later search. That evening around 6.37 p.m., a car was spotted behind a Walmart in Princeton, West Virginia. It was a green Mercury Grand Marquis. It was the Russell's car. However, Sammy and the Russell's were nowhere to be found. Law enforcement did look at the car. And they found blood in the car. The keys to the car were gone. The next day, February 23rd, law enforcement began a search of the wooded area behind the Walmart where the car was found. West Virginia has some dense woods and mountain areas. Law enforcement used a helicopter and a search dog to track down Sammy Littleton Jr. They found him and arrested him on a fugitive warrant. When Sammy was searched, they found the Russell's car keys in his pocket. He was arrested over 300 miles from Logan County, Ohio. Tiffany Brown's funeral also happened on February the 23rd at the First Church of God. It is said that towards the end of the service, that family members announced that Sammy had been arrested in West Virginia. Later that day, law enforcement did a press release. They were still looking for the Russells. They told the public that blood had been found in the car. Sammy was booked into the Southern Regional Jail in West Virginia. If law enforcement wanted to talk to Sammy, they would have to go to Princeton because Sammy decided that he wasn't coming back to Ohio easily. Sammy planned to fight extradition back to Ohio. He was going to stay in the Southern Regional Jail pending his extradition hearing without bail. Sammy wasn't going to come back to Ohio without some kind of a deal with law enforcement. Why did Sammy not want to go to trial for the murder of Tiffany Brown? Law enforcement did several recorded interviews with Sammy. He said he doesn't know why he killed Tiffany. He just snapped. She had come over to his house on February the 11th, and they had gotten into an argument. He snapped and started to strangle her. Then he stabbed her. 
Samuel told law enforcement that he constantly had evil thoughts. He always was thinking of hurting people, punching or kicking or smashing things over people's heads. He had serious anger issues. Law enforcement needed Samuel to tell them what happened to Richard and Gladys Russell. On February the 25th, Samuel admitted that he killed the Russell couple and he had dumped their bodies in a cotton field in Georgia on his way to Florida. It was confirmed that Samey was in Georgia. An officer down in Georgia had tried to pull the car over for a minor traffic violation, but the car never stopped. It fled off. It is a Georgia policy not to pursue a fleeing car. He could have been arrested in Georgia. But apparently in Georgia, they don't chase after criminals for minor traffic violations, even if they do flee an officer. At first he said that he didn't know why he killed the Russells, but it was mostly for their car. He strangled them and then put their bodies in the trunk of their car. Law enforcement believes that Gladys was killed in the garage on the Russell property. In the afternoon of the next day, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, two men were looking for scrap metal on Lightfoot Mill Road near a railroad trussel. This was about 10 minutes from Interstate 75. They found the body of an elderly man. It would take till March 1st for the body to be confirmed as 84-year-old Richard Russell. Tennessee law enforcement searched the area by helicopter for the body of Gladys. Gladys' body was never found in Tennessee. Gladys' body would not be found till March 9th, and her body was found in a cotton field in Georgia. To me, it sounds like he did not have this planned out. Well, at least Russell murders. It seems like he freaked out when he tried to cover up what he had done. Sam Littleton Jr. was facing three counts of aggravated murder. If he would have gone to trial, he could have faced the death penalty. Law enforcement needed to get Sammy back to Ohio. It was decided to reach a plea agreement with Sammy while he was still in West Virginia. Sammy agreed to take a plea deal. He would be sentenced to life without parole in prison and he would not be able to appeal his sentence. The plea deal was talked over with the families of Tiffany Brown and the Russell couple. They decided that life in prison without a chance of him being able to appeal his sentence was better than keep seeing him in court for future appeals for what could have been over the death penalty. The deal was taken to Sammy in West Virginia. All Sammy had to do was agree to the deal and come back to Ohio and make it official. I'm wondering why Sammy was so determined that he did not go on trial for the three murders that happened in Bell Fountain. Was there someone else besides himself that he was trying to protect by not going to trial? Law enforcement says that Sammy really did not fully explain his actions. He did keep telling them that he constantly thought bad things. I wonder though, did he think that if he did go to trial, that by saying that he had evil thoughts, that he could use that for an insanity plea? On April 14th, 2011, Sammy was brought back to Ohio. He was booked in a county jail, fingerprinted, and then taken to a court hearing. The victim's family was at the hearing to make Sammy's plea deal official. Sammy did not acknowledge any one of the family members. It is said that Sammy's hands were trembling throughout the whole hearing. Of course, this could be because he was going to prison for the rest of his life. The plea deal was made official. Sammy was convicted of murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without a chance of parole 
or being able to appeal his sentence. Deb, Tiffany's mom, she was stated as saying that she felt that Sammy was sorry for what he had done. Then she called him a coward. I am Bill Swafford and this has been Murderers in Ohio. I want to say thank you to the person who brought this case to my attention and for the help that they gave me. We got the devil on the road in Ohio.